Argije. So we are now continuing, going more deeply into the song Gopinath by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And uh, it's been quite a journey so far, really. Uh, entering the mood of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and uh, trying to understand it, trying to imbibe it, if we can, imbibe it. And uh, it's, I think, been, for some devotees, a little bit of a challenge to kind of relate to it and, and uh, kind of uh, write it off, maybe, like it's not for me, or this is light years away. But that's not the point. The point is to uh, let a little of that mood rub off on us. That's the, that's the idea. So, we are um, going to go, uh, in, we're on the second part of Gopinath. There's three parts. And we're going to go more into, uh, more into the mood. And um, if there's any questions you had from last week, then... Uh, I think we answered all of them, but sometimes class, because class has to end on time, sometimes I miss them. So if there are any, then you can ask them. And it looks like my picture is freezing. And um, I wasn't able to find out how to adjust the resolution within Facebook. I think it adjusted automatically, but it's a, a resolution issue, and I don't know how to change it, actually. Maybe my webcam. My webcam is quite basic. It doesn't allow you to change resolution. So that's why we get the freezing. As I said many times, it's not ecstatic symptoms. You see me freezing. Oh, he must be in ecstasy. Stunned. The symptom would be stunned. No. Maybe Facebook's in ecstasy. I don't know. But my internet company said... In a few months, they said in two months, and that was like 10 days ago, they said in two months, Lachua, and the internet will be speeded up. It's kind of a kind of a problem, though, because they said it's going to be 5G, which apparently is very unhealthy. So if that's the case, I would only use 5G for uploading... Uh, when I give class and then otherwise. I don't really think I need it, and I'd like not to have to deal with it if I didn't have to, because it's, it's not so great. Of course, my generation won't be the generation to find out how not so great it was. You're, the younger generation will find out when you get older. Um, if something is bad and there's, you know, new diseases coming up that we never heard of before. So, well, it's radiation oriented. Mm, Haribo, Haribo. So, we're going to go to Vrindavan. Janaranjana Chamunatira 
Vana chari Jamuna tira Vana chari Jeradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Marhava Kunjabi Hari Kupi Kapi Janavalava Giri Varudha Gopisana Vallabha Giribhara Dari Tusodhananana Bajajana Ranjana Tusodhananana Bajajana Ranjana Jamunati Banacha Jamuna Tira Banachari Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Radha Madhava Punjabi Hari Daigo Premanandi Hari Hari Gaura 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 Nitananda Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sarashati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvise Sasanyavari Nasyacha Desatarine <coughs> Hare Krishna Panchakalpa Turuvescha Kripashinubhyevacha Potitanam Pavanebio Vaishnavibio Namam Namaha Mukam Koroti Vachalam Pangulangayate Girim Yakripa Tamaham Vande Siguru Dinatarina Si Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nitananda Shadaita Gadadhara Shivashari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur Ki Jai He is bestowing his mercy upon us by allowing, allowing us to recite this song, to hear about this song, to understand his heart, to understand his love. And when we see something in his expression that we don't understand, the default answer is it's his love. And so love of Krishna, maybe we don't understand it so well, but it's Bhaktivinoda Thakur's love that we're having a difficult time understanding as it manifests in extreme humility, extreme lamentation, transcendental lamentation. And, but we, we always, always should think that what may seem to be like a material deficiency is actually a manifestation of his love. And then that explains why it's difficult to understand, because it's difficult to understand love of God when you don't have something and you don't have experience of it, you can't really relate to it well. And that's why sometimes the emotions expressed by pure devotees seem to be material emotions because we have 
If we have those emotions, it would be symptoms of something material. When they have those emotions, they're symptoms of something spiritual, symptom of bhava or prema. So that's how we understand. So We don't want anyone to become discouraged by hearing his piteous pleas, thinking, well, if that's what happens, when you become more advanced, you still remain in a piteous condition, a difficult condition, then what is the hope of my future? But it's not like that. It's actually, this piteous condition has nothing to do with the trials and tribulations under the influence of the three modes of nature. So it, it's purely a transcendental spiritual emotion. So always have to remember that. Okay, so now we're on text four of part two. Gopinath amito tomara jana. Tomara charya sangshara bhajinu. Bhulia apane dhana. So ami, ami means I. Amito, I am certainly tomara jana, your devotee. He's making a plea here, remember? He's like, here are the facts. I'm fallen, but I'm your devotee. Tomara Charya, having abandoned you, Sangshara Bajinu, I have worshipped this mundane world. Bulia Apana Dana, thus having forgotten my real treasure. This is depressing to think about, I will admit, but very inspiring at the same time. O Gopinath, I am your devotee, but because I abandoned you and thus forgot my real treasure, I have worshipped this mundane world. So he's, he's not stating, I am your devotee as a plea. I was first thinking, I mean, you could say it's a plea, I'm your devotee, so help me. But he's stating a philosophical point here. I am your devotee, and even though I'm your devotee, basically I gave up acting as your devotee. And all the treasures that come with bhakti, I gave them up also. And what did I give them up for? For worshiping the material world. So this is, this is an expression of remorse. And, and, and within the Japa workshops I've done, we've talked a little bit about this idea that this can empower your Japa. We uh, recently put out a little video about this, which you must have seen, about the, the chanting and remorse and how empowering and inspiring it can be. So, when we look at what we've done, we feel a lot of shame that here is Krishna, the person who's I'm eternally related to, who's my best friend, best lover, ever well-wisher, etc., the one who's, who's giving me life, the one who's maintaining my life, the one who, without whom nothing could exist, everything I have is actually his, etc. And we're so ungrateful, we, it's kind of like saying, I don't care. I'm, I'm off on my own way. And if we think about this, it is depressing. I will be the first one to admit it. It is very depressing that we have done such a thing. But that depression is purifying and that depression is inspiring. And someone might say, well, a depression? A, an inspiring depression. Hmm. Hmm, I've never heard of that. An inspiring depression. Um, well, if, if you look at it in terms of relationships in this world, sometimes we may do something with a friend or a spouse or a parent or a sibling that we later regret having done, right? And so if we think about it, it we feel very ashamed and depressed as we think about what we did. And we'll say things like that was so bad, so wrong, so foolish, I am so bad for having done that. I can't believe I did that, etc. And when we go through that, most people will then think, I have to make up for that. 
that was so bad. I, I have to, I can't act that way anymore. I have to act with respect, with love, with compassion, with affection. I have to never do what I did before. And the regret, if it goes deeply enough, it actually prevents you from having a relapse, so to speak, into those behaviors. So when we meditate on those behaviors, if it causes us to feel that this was so bad, I never, ever will do this again. I never, ever want to do this again. It's just the thought of, of doing it, is, it just destroys me. If it brings us to that position, then that thought becomes our, one of our greatest inspirations to go forward in our bhakti. Look what I've done. How could I have done this? I have to make up for this. Of course, Krishna is fine. It's like, don't worry about it. Krishna doesn't hold grudges. But for our own purification, we, we hold ourselves accountable to a certain degree, accountable to the degree that it would inspire us to change. And we know once we make that change, Krishna will deal with us in the present, from right now, present tense. He's not going to worry about what we did in the back, past. He's going to look at us now and say, okay, you're good. You've, you've rectified yourself. You're trying your best to engage in devotional service. And that's, that's how he sees it. And because he wants the relationship, so whatever happened in the past, it's not a problem. I want the relationship, so now that I see that you want it, then let's, let's move forward in the relationship. That's the idea. Um, so now, also, sometimes devotees pray to their minds, which is just a form of kind of, you say, the intelligence speaking or the soul speaking to the mind. And saying in this connection, it would say, in this context, it would say something like, okay, Krish, okay, you've worshipped matter since time immemorial, and you've just experienced pain. So don't, you reason with yourself. So this life now, give that up. It doesn't work. It's only brought you further away from Krishna. And the only thing that is going to cause you pain in the material world is being separated from your relationship with Krishna, not having a strong relationship with Krishna. That is what is, that is, what is underlying all pain. That is the foundational cause of pain. And, and having compassion upon yourself you tell yourself, I, I don't want to cause this pain to myself any further. I've caused it for lifetimes. Since time immemorial, I've been causing myself pain. I don't want to cause myself pain anymore. And I don't want to cause Krishna pain anymore. I was reading something today. It was so amazing. It was incredible. And Prabhupada was talking about the power of love. And he said, and Prabhupada said, I can't, he said, I can't force you to do anything. He said, I could chastise you, but I can't force you because the only way you'll actually do it is out of love. He said, love, love is everything. That's the greatest motivator. So even though I'm your spiritual master, and even though I try to, he didn't say it this way, but that's a connotation, force you to do something, I can't force you because it's only by love that you would do it. Or if Prabhupada chastises us, it's only because of love that we accept the chastisement, right? If Prabhupada forces us to do something, quote unquote, force, it's only because of love for him that we would do it. So this is, this is the greatest motivator to stop doing things which are self-destructive. The greatest motivator is a little bit of love. 
for Guru and Krishna. And, and out of that love, we do what they want. We do the right thing. So, ultimately, without some affection, it's really, really difficult. But you just always do what's right. And when you're confronted with temptation, you're confronted with desire, with attachment, so many things. What is going to really motivate you to turn your face? That's the love for Krishna, the love for the spiritual master. For Krishna, I've turned my face away from you for so many lives. And even though it, it is this particular situation is tempting me, out of my love for you, my affection, I will turn my face away from that and towards you. That's the idea. So you know, we apply that love to Srila Prabhupada. We apply that love to our spiritual master. We find incredible impetus to do what may be impossible for us to do. That's how powerful love is. It can cause us to do the impossible. It's the greatest inspiration. It's the greatest motivation. So where that, where that affection is there for Guru, for the devotees we're working with, for temple, uh, leaders in our temple authorities, so the more there's affection, the more there's impetus. We, want, we, we, we as human beings naturally like to do things that please other people. We like to, we, it, it, just the feeling that I've done something that was wanted by someone else that makes them happy. The feelings, it's supreme feeling. And feelings are what motivates us. What motivates us? Feelings motivate us. Feelings are what motivates us. So what can be a greater motivator than love? And what could be a greater handicap than self-centeredness? Right? You agree? So this is, um, it's just a little secret that I've talked about before. And it was kind of like, when people would, not kind of like, when people would ask what is, you know, what is your motive? How do you stay motivated? You know, an important question, right? You ask a, a devotee is very inspired, how do you stay motivated? And this is, for me, this is, this is like it. This is where the rubber hits the road. Because this is what Prabhupada wanted. So if Prabhupada wants something and you're so aligned with this desire that you could do it even though it's difficult, then your spiritual life more or less is guaranteed now because you'll, you'll be empowered by that affection that, or that affection for your spiritual master. He wants this done. It's difficult for me. Not so inspired, but because he wants it done, that's my inspiration. So, same with Krishna. Krishna, I have not loved you for millions of lives. <clears throat> I don't want to live another life like that. I don't want to live another life worshiping matter. And which Prabhupada says, I mean, Prabhupada sometimes was very blunt because sometimes you need to be blunt to break someone from material attachment. You know, it's like you're holding on to something. You say, let go, let go. No, I can't let go. If you don't let go, a tiger's going to eat you. Oh, okay, that, that shocked me enough to let go. So I will, I will let go. So Prabhupada was like that. He would sometimes say things that, you know, were, would shock us out of our attachment, and nothing else would shock us. No, no, nothing less than a shocking statement would shock us out of our attachment. So, in, in Prabhupada talking about material entanglement, love of Krishna, what's getting in the way of love of Krishna, we're selfish. And he would sometimes say, so what is that selfishness? What is that focus? He said, simply sex. You know, he just like kind of pinpointed the target. And, you know, sometimes he would use more graphic words than sex, if you could imagine. I'm not going to mention them. But just like, 
If you don't want Krishna, you want so sex, but he described it more graphically, and it's just like, well, better than that, and it would shake us up. And it would shake up us up so much, we would, it would knock, Prabhu, I'm gonna knock the Maya out of you. This, Prabhu, this statement is gonna knock the Maya out of you. So, it's actually, there are a lot of statements in which Prabhupada knocked the Maya out of us, like really hard. So those statements are helpful, useful. If you, if you need a few, go to the fifth canto. You'll get plenty. Just boom, boom, boom. Punch, punch, punch. Um, because what is Bhakti Vinod Thakur saying? You know, I, I'm like so foolish. I'm a devotee and I'm worshiping matter instead of worshiping you. And we all know that that proclivity to worship matter, it's very deeply rooted. So sometimes Prabhupada will kick us with a few statements, just sober us up. But I've also, we are also here, we're talking about love. That was the original, I got a little sidetracked. The original point was, if there's love, you can do something which maybe you couldn't do if you didn't have love. But it's also true, not only for Guru, but it's also true for yourself. Like, would, would you, do you love yourself enough to not do something that's self-destructive? That's a good question. And I hope the answer is yes. And if the answer isn't yes, it has to become yes. Because that can be a saving grace when we're tempted to do something which is unhealthy or not do something we should do, the question is, you're going to ask yourself, you can say, do you love yourself enough to do this? Or do you love yourself enough that you won't do this? That you won't give in to temptation? And you meditate on that. And if you can come to this point in your consciousness where you say, you know, I would never do that to myself. I, I want to do my senses, my mind wants to do this, but I would never do that to myself because the result of doing that would be destructive. Passion to do that to myself. I, I think that way all the time. Like, why would I do this if it's destroying myself? And I think. Well, the only reason I would do it is because I don't care about myself. And so, you know, you can change the mantra a little bit if you don't want to say that. If you just say, loving myself doesn't sound right to you. I care about myself. I that's a, that's a, that's, we need to be in that, we need, we need to be in that state where we care about ourselves enough to do the right thing and not to do the wrong thing. So, we have some work ahead of us, right? But this, the power of love of Guru, love of Krishna, or potential love of Krishna, or affection for Krishna, love for Guru, love of self, that can help you overcome your own self. Or the power of love of a friend. You. You promise a friend you won't do something. And out of fidelity to that friend and to the promise to that friend, even if you want to do it, you don't do it because you promised him and you, you have a relationship with him. And that relationship is, is nurtured by that promise and because the relationship is important, you keep the promise. So these are, these are some items to cultivate in your life that will serve you tremendously in your spiritual life, especially in difficult situations, you'll think, well, you'll think, even though I'm inclined to do this, or I'm not in the best association right now, or whatever, um, I love my spiritual master, I love Prabhupada, Krishna, myself, too much to allow myself to do that. And let and you you let your mind know that, you know. If you have to tell your mind that every day, 
That's fine, just tell it. Hey mind, I just want you to remember that you know you come up with all kinds of crazy ideas, but I love myself too much to entertain that, or I care about myself too much to entertain all your stupid ideas. So you know what? Just stop coming up with them because I'm not interested. It it um it can actually recondition the way the mind thinks. It will if you develop that way of thinking, it starts to become a habit, a belief. And so the mind just doesn't come up with self-destructive thoughts anymore. Wouldn't that be amazing? Put it in quotes. We have to use these quotes for something. Put them up somewhere. If you don't know what to do with these quotes, just send them to me and send them to Satya Rupa. She'll put them, Radha Priya, put them on Facebook. Do you love yourself enough to do something that's not self-destructive? That's it. Or change it around. I love myself too much to do something that's self-destructive. That'd be a nice t-shirt also, right? I have um, contemplated this concept a lot. And the reason I've contemplated it a lot is because when I should do I say, why wouldn't you do this? Like, it looks like you don't care. You don't care enough about your spiritual life because you're not doing this. And I said to myself, one of the many conversations I've had with myself, maybe, maybe I should write a book, Conversations with, not God, with myself. Of course, we could say they're actually conversations with super soul, but uh, in the conversation that I would have, I'd say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Like, what, like, no, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say, like, what is wrong with you that you don't care about yourself? Like, you would, you, you're actually thinking of not doing this? Or vice versa, you're thinking of doing something that's not good for you? And I would ask myself, I said, this is really strange. Like, why would anyone in their right mind do something which is harmful? For which the only answer is, because they're not in their right mind. Because if they were, they wouldn't do it. But, of course, that's kind of a joke. But I went a little deeper, and I started thinking. This is like I didn't, didn't understand the concept of self-love, or I hadn't read anything about it in the world of psychology. But I started thinking, well, maybe there's a lack of self-love. Maybe I don't care. Maybe deep down inside, I actually think I deserve to suffer. And, and it was, I didn't know if that were true, but these thoughts were coming. Like, like why wouldn't you do that? You think you, like you don't deserve to get Krishna's mercy, or you think you actually deserve to suffer because you've done so many bad things. So I was contemplating these ideas. And that, on some level, started to make sense to me. I said, is there part of me that doesn't like myself to the point that I think I would actually cause myself suffering? And it was just a question. It was just like an intuition. Is there, is there any... It's like, I think like I actually deserve to suffer. And just these ideas were coming. Like I said, I'd never read anything about this anywhere. It was just, I was questioning myself. And then subsequently, having studied this a little more, I came to understand, yeah, there can be a part of us that thinks we actually deserve to suffer, which is so um, subtle that it, that it could because we think we deserve to suffer. So, you know, it's hard to do, and I deserve to suffer. Conclusion is, don't do it. And after I read that, I chanted a mantra, and the mantra went like this. Whoa! That was my mantra. That's a whoa statement, isn't it? Like, whoa, that's like, that's heavy, right? 
So I can't speak for you. I can only speak for myself, but I think my relating, my little contemplation or conversation with myself may be relatable to you. You may feel there's a part of you that, that sometimes says, I don't care. And that, if, if you ever say, I don't care, I think we talked about this in another class. You know, the kids, when the kids are eating sweets and the parents say, don't eat. And we talked about it on Saturday night with the Chinese devotees. And the parents say, don't eat sweets, it's not good for you. And the, what does the kid say? I don't care. So if there's ever this, this, it may not be a voice, you may not be verbalizing it, it may not even be in your head but it may be a consciousness of I don't care. If you, ever, if you ever feel that, like when you should or shouldn't do something, this, this I don't care feeling comes, the, the alarm should go off in your head because that is a big problem. We should care. So the mood of Bhakti Vinod Thakur is like, look what I've done. I do care that I did that. I do care that I neglected you. I do care. I want to do something about it. I want to rectify it. We should care. You agree we should care? Do you agree? Of course you agree. We have to care sufficiently. And you might say, but you said, well, you just care about your service to your guru. Yes. But really, really, you have to care about yourself to care about his service. You have, when you care about his service, you care about yourself. When you care about yourself, you care about his service. They, they tend to go together. So that's something to contemplate. Allow yourself, allow yourself to, go in, to go into some state of remorse when you think about having not served Krishna for millions of lifetimes, how bad it is. It's really bad, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And we know it is, and it's... It's, um, it's horrendous, and it can have a horrendous effect on our psychology, but that's good, because if it brings us to this point where I never again want to turn my back on Krishna, then that remorse, that was the most purifying thing you could, you could do. You know, like we're looking at this, oh, he seems like he's lamenting, he even seems like he's depressed or giving up. But, but when, if you can enter that state to such a degree that it, that it just eliminates that I don't care mood anymore, well, certainly that was purifying, extremely purifying, extremely beneficial, wanted, right? So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. There's, you know, depression at its best. Maybe that should be the name of this class, depression at its best. And people like, depression at its best? I don't know about that. How does that work? Well, that's what's happening in this deep lamentation and depression. They're just like hitting this point where it's like, okay, that's it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that again. And, and I think all of us, we need to come to that point in our lives, and maybe not just once, but on a regular basis. Kind of that remorse or that that shloka of, was it Jamunacharya? Was it Jamunacharya? When I think of sex, I become just, I think of the sex I had before I came to bhakti, I, I makes, I'm disgusted. It's just like, what I did is so bad, I, I can never do that again. That's, that's where we want to come to. It's like, you know, I, I often think about it. And I kind of do a little test with myself. I say, okay, so let's see how detached you actually are. Now, what if Krishna provided you A, B, C, D, E, F, G? You know, it's right there in front of you. What would you do? And it's all sense gratification. You know, all things that, the, that every conditioned soul likes. Not only likes, adores. And Krishna puts it in front of you. What would you do? And... Um, I think, I try to think, I try to feel, and generally I do, more, more or less spontaneously, but not when I was a young devotee necessarily. I feel like, nadanam, nadjanam, nasundaram. I, 
I am a devotee, I have no use for these things. They might be attractive to my conditioned side, but as a devotee, I don't have any use for them because I'm not worshiping Maya anymore. I want to worship Krishna. And if I give in to these temptations, that's just a huge setback. That's just, you know, I, I ran 100 miles and I ran back 150. I don't want to do that. So, you know, and if you do the test and you say, I probably would give in to some of those things, then you know, got some ways to go because it should be, it should be, no, I love my guru too much and I love myself too much that I would give in to these things. That's, the, that's supposed to be the answer. And in a more advanced stage is I'm not attracted. I just, not that I'm not genom nisindering. I don't want wealth, women, followers. That's a more advanced stage. Until we're on that stage, I love myself too much to give in to that. I love Krishna too much. I love Prabhupada. I love my guru too much. I love bhakti too much, all these things to give in to it. <clears throat> That's the idea. Krishna, Krishna, Hari. Oh, yeah. I had, um, yeah, I had the echo on. Sorry about that. It was the temple effect. Hmm. Yeah, I think I had it on yesterday and didn't take it off. Sorry about that. You all should have been screaming. Turn off the echo! Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, that's the disadvantage of Facebook. If it was um, Zoom, you could have just told me. Okay, well, better. we caught it better late than never. Maybe um, the, the facility of the echo is that you hear it twice. So, as later says... Uh, Tengo una pregunta. That means I have a question. Is it better to vote in white than to vote for someone in matters of political election? Since on one hand, one is as obliged uh, to not get karma. Is it better to vote in white? And maybe this is a translation. Does that mean better not to vote? than to vote for someone in matters of political election. Well, there are different ways to look at it. But, you know, you can get some karma for voting for someone, so they better be doing the right thing. Otherwise, you're going to share in some of that karma on some level. So, um, You know, there are, different, there are different considerations. Sometimes the consideration is very practical. A political leader will foster an agenda that's very helpful for what we're doing, um, getting permissions, getting facilities, and so forth. And someone may have an agenda that would make it difficult, more difficult for us. So on that basis, we may, may decide who to vote for. It's not like a major political issue. Uh, this, this leader will promote more religious freedom, it'll give us more facilities. Um, they have, they give money to nonprofit organizations or schools that would help us. No, so those kinds of things are practical consideration. But general, personal, your personal preference, there'll be some karmic reaction there. Now, if we follow Prabhupada very strictly on this, he, Prabhupada said, we only vote for political leaders who take Krishna Prasadam, or we could say who have taken Krishna Prasadam. So, um, you know Donald Trump took Krishna Prasadam, don't you? So on that basis, it was okay to vote for him, right? He actually took Prasadam. Hmm. Well, at least he was given Prasadam. No, he, as far as the story was told, he ate it all. He liked it. So... So John has a quote from St. Paul. If I have not love, I'm just a changing symbol, a noisy going. Yeah. If you don't have love, what are you?
So what did I say? The, the ecstasy of depression? Is that it? No. Yeah, okay. Let me write that down. It kind of, kind of sounds like Buddha, some Buddhist, Buddhistic saying, but today in the world of marketing, you have to have catchy titles. You know, otherwise there's like 10 million videos being uploaded every nanosecond. So to break through the traffic, you have to have something. <laughs> the ecstasy. What did I say? The ecstasy of depression. Yeah, so, but if you study Krishna consciousness, you'll see there definitely is a place for depression, lamentation, remorse. Definitely a place, but not not in the sense we may be familiar with it, even in other religious traditions, but in the sense of creating immense immense purification, immense rectification, immense benefit. And as I've said a million times, so this will be a million and one times, anything that brings you closer to Krishna is going to make you happy, even if it's lament, lamentation, even if it's depression, whatever it is, austerity, sacrifice, sense control, whatever it is, if it brings you closer to Krishna, it's going to make you happy. It has to. It can't. It cannot not make you happy. So you can't look at something at face value and say, oh, this is depressing. Say, but if that depression inspires you in your spiritual life, it's going to make you very happy. Right? Isn't it? You agree? You have experience? Any of you have experience? Like we say, depression at its best. Okay, that's a good one. Happy depression. How about that, Nadia? Happy depression. Ecstatic depression. How are you today, Prabhu? I am ecstatically depressed. Hmm, fantastic. That's great news. Glad to hear it. Can you be ecstatically depressed? There's a bird. He's always like going on my window looking in and I'm starting to think he's like a devotee in his past life who's like knows me. It's very strange. He's always on my window looking in. This was like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Who is he? You may not know Alfred Hitchcock, but he used to maybe you do. He used to make horror movies. Who is this bird? You know, what's the story behind this bird in his last life? He was so and so dust, but he did this. <clears throat> and now he was an associate of Mahatma Prabhu, but now he ended up in a bird's body and he wants to get association with devotees again. And he's always saying he's not talking though, so I don't know what he's saying. Um So now there's a question. If we're nothing without love, then what should these people do who have no love for anyone? Jump off the bridge? Or is there a chance for them to develop some love? Well, if, if there's a bridge over a temple... And if they jump off the bridge and they end up in the temple room, yeah, then they should. But if the bridge is over an ocean and they're going to drown, no, they shouldn't. So every anything that's not Krishna conscious doesn't mean there's any fundamental state that's not Krishna conscious. There's no fundamental assessment essential state of non-Krishna consciousness. So fundamental, I don't know, fundamental is the right word. Original. Why can't I think of the word? Yeah, Prabhupada said originally we're all Krishna conscious. Our original state, our pure state. Our pure state is love of Krishna. So yeah, there is hope, but there's a lot of things there are a lot of boulders blocking that love that have to be removed. And not everyone's ready to remove those boulders. So, of course, there's hope. 
because you don't have to create, you don't have to mix up love of Krishna. It's there. It's just you gotta remove everything over it. So that's the that's why Prabhupada was so enthusiastic about spreading Krishna consciousness everywhere to everybody because he saw that everyone by nature, that's the word, everyone by nature is Krishna conscious. So it's not like we're trying to do something that's awkward or unnatural. We're, we're trying to do the most natural thing, which is just help people come back to their original consciousness. Right? So... That, that, as I've said, that, as I've said, um, um, Nadia, has been one of the most, for me personally, and I encourage you also, it's been one of the most encouraging meditations, when, especially when you find it difficult to become Krishna conscious, that, that I do not have to create Krishna consciousness. It's already created. I, that's who I am. I just have to get everything out of the way. It's like, hey, behind the furniture and the refrigerator and the stove, and you just move it all out. There's this little diamond, you know. Okay, let's move the fridge. I don't see it. Move the stove, you know. Oh, it must be stuck behind the wall. Knock the wall, you know. Oh, it fell into the ground. Dig it up. There it is. I found it. It's just all this stuff is in the way. So I don't have to create the diamond. That's not what we're doing. The diamond is there. It's just I have to get everything out of the way so I can find it. So that, you know, when you sometimes feel like, well, it's so hard to be Krishna conscious. It's like, well, you are, but that's what you are. So that statement, of course, we understand what you mean when you say it. But really what you're saying is, it's not hard to be Krishna conscious. It's hard to remove all the things that are covering my Krishna consciousness. That's the precise, precise statement. Because when you find the diamond, you don't have to make it a diamond. It already is. You, you know, you can wash it off a little bit. But the diamond is a diamond. It does its thing. It does what diamonds do. They shine, reflect light. Right? So you don't have to make the diamond a diamond. So it's so hard to be Krishna conscious. No, it's not. You already are. It's just hard to uncover it. That's the hard part. So that that uh, hopefully that will encourage all of you when you're having hard times, so to speak, and finding it, uh, losing your inspiration, or finding it difficult to be Krishna conscious, just this thought, well, I already am Krishna conscious, so it's not like that hard if that's what I am. You know, it's kind of like, I have millions of dollars in the bank, I just don't know what bank they're in. And you know, my father left me a million dollars, but he never, didn't tell me what bank. And what bank account? So I have to call every bank in the universe and tell them my name and say, this is the situation. Do you have an account for this person? And I have to go there and show them my papers that I inherited all my father's property. So it's like the money is already there. And say, but I'm so poor. Yeah, because you haven't found the money. But once you find the money, you won't be poor. But you have the money. Your wealth, your wealth. You are wealthy. You are Krishna conscious. Nadia, you are Krishna conscious. That's who you are. You just got to find what bank it's in. That's all. What bank did I leave my Krishna consciousness in? Hmm, I forgot. It was like a long, long time ago. I left it in some bank. I don't even know the name or the account number or anything. I have to find out. Well, not even find out. We've already found out how, you know, here's the bank. Just go there. Long, long drive, but let's start. That's the idea. So P says, I so much needed exactly these words today. I sat in tears over things in life. I'm giving up and open this just to hear you talk about depression. Thank you so much for helping me to see that this is the right way to go. Thank you for confirming it. So, yeah, as Krishna uses us. You came and I spoke, you know, I like all works, somehow or other. Guru Nishta says, many years back when I had asked you what kept you going all these years, you replied that you couldn't accept that Maya would defeat you. 
That's just my stubbornness. <laughs> don't like to lose. I, I don't mind losing, but not to Maya. Um, well, let me explain why I said that. It's because the reason the reason I said that was because Prabhupada has taught us how to defeat Maya. So it's like, how can I let Maya defeat me if I already if I know everything I need to know to defeat her? I just like I can't give into that. I know and I know what's gonna happen if I give into it. I just become unhappy and frustrated, separated from Krishna, etc., etc., and I won't be able to help anyone. Can't help myself, who can't help anybody else. So that was kind of the mood of saying that with with you know. How can you get lost with a map? You know, I have the map out of here. So that's really, you know, you have a map and you still can't get out of here? That's bad. So it was kind of like that. How can I allow myself to get lost? I have a map. So that was my mood. So Deepak says, Depression gave me bhakti. Just got to hang in there and pray to Krishna to get through it. Mm. Huh. Ladies and gentlemen, do not accept defeat by Maya. And also, you know, we, we talk about fighting. Maybe some of you would like another analogy, a better analogy. If you can come up with a better analogy that better suits you, that's fine. I just use the word fight because Prabhupada used it to become Krishna conscious to become Krishna conscious is to declare war in Maya. Those are Prabhupada's words. So, um, <laughs> we have Laura up late at night. She's in. She's trying to go to bed, but she can't because it's. She's in Australia. That's the one place where the Australian Hawaii. I guess there may be a few other places where I don't have disciples, but those two places always they kind of always end up off the time chart map. So now it's like, what time is it for you? 10.30 at night, Laura, or 11.30? Something like that. Anyway, what to do? Um, you know, Gurunishta, we could say that you know, whatever mantra works for you, not for you personally, but for all of you, whatever mantra works for you to inspire you, then, then you know, use it. You know, like, I'm just sharing my realizations. They may work for you, but if they don't, the principle is analyze your situation in a way that you can reason with yourself, you can reason your way out of your own discouragement. That's the idea, so that's... One way I reasoned it was I wouldn't do that to myself. And um, and if you say, if you want to use that mantra, you say, I love myself too much to do that. But you actually have to love yourself. You can't just say it. So that consciousness has to be there, right? Uh, so Stephanie says, by the end of the day, the boulders build up and I have a hard time motivating to do any sadhana before bed. Do you have any suggestions to help? Yeah. Just go to the Nike website and read what it says there. I think it says just do it, doesn't it? Yeah. That's my suggestion. Um, Stephanie, we're coming out with a video. Uh, oh. Depression has value. It is taught in counseling courses. Yeah, to face your stuff, face your emotions. 12 a.m., oh my God. Face your stuff, face your emotions. Face it all. You can't run away from it, yeah, for sure. So, um, I, Stephanie, I just made a video um, about this topic, and my realization is that Sometimes, when you don't want to do something, you wait, isn't it? Well, I'll wait till I feel like doing it. But sometimes, 
it's too late to wait because you're waiting and you need to get it done and you're not feeling like it. So this is quite a common situation. And sometimes, maybe we, maybe we can't say 100% of the time, but sometimes you're just going to have to do it anyway. It's like, I don't feel like it. What, what's the best suggestion when you don't feel like doing something? Oh, just do it. Of course, you might say, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't answer my question. But sometimes that's the only answer, you know. Whether I feel like it or not, I just have to do it because I have to do it. You know, Krishna told Arjuna, fight for the sake of fighting. That's like kind of like just do it, you know, because I don't feel like, Krishna, I don't feel like fighting. Well, you're chatra, just do it, you know. That's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, but I don't feel like it. I know you don't feel like it. But we need you to do it. So just, you know, just do it. That's basically what Krishna's telling Arjuna, and Arjuna's going, I don't feel like it. Just do it. But I don't feel like it. But just do it. But I have all these reasons I don't feel like it. Yeah. I have all these reasons, and all these reasons are making me not feel like, it. yeah, I know, but just do it. And those reasons, in this, in this context, those reasons just, they don't work. Just do it. So that's kind of how the conversation was going. And that's why I say sometimes I just have to do it. There ain't no other way sometimes. But I can give you another way, since you asked. Think about ramifications. If I don't do this, what is the result? If I do do this, what is the result? And sometimes the difference is drastic enough to motivate you to do it. Or sometimes the consequences of not doing it are so bad that you just do it, or the consequences of doing it are so good that you just tell yourself, how can I not do this? This is it's too good. I just have to do it. So how's that? Is that okay for starters? I mean, ultimately, there's a deeper answer than both of those. And the deepest answer is to come, we want to come to this position in bhakti where this is the most important thing. This is why I'm alive. I am alive. Why are you alive? I'm alive to die in Krishna consciousness. That's why I'm alive. I'm practicing now how I can die in Krishna consciousness. Everything else is secondary. Everything I do in my life is a practice for perfecting, perfecting my life in bhakti, ultimately for remembering Krishna at the time of death. So when you start putting things in priority, then it's easier to do what you have to do. You know, what if, what if you were completely in the consciousness that I'm, I'm right now in this body to perfect my Krishna consciousness. That's my purpose in life. Everything else is to support it. Whatever else I do, my work, my family, the shopping, the cleaning, everything is just to support this one goal of my life, which is to be Krishna conscious, go back to Godhead. If that's your fundamental state of consciousness, then you will find the motive to do practically anything you need to do in Krishna consciousness because you always remember that's what I'm existing for. That's why I'm here. That's my purpose. You know, Srila Prabhupada so often was telling us, finish up your business in this life. Don't take another life. So he was, you know, always putting us in that consciousness that you are here for one purpose, to be Krishna conscious. Everything else is not that important. So when other things become that important, quote unquote, then, then, then we have problems. Because now there's competition for getting our attention. There's competition for our motivation. So, you know, everything you do, you ask, well, how important is this for my Krishna consciousness? And that puts things in perspective, right? Now, I know some of you may be thinking, but that's like a very exalted way of thinking. I'm just thinking, if it's good for my Krishna consciousness, I do it. If it's not, I don't. That's true. It is an exalted way of thinking. At the same time, it is a principle that we're supposed to think that way. So... Practice makes perfect. So practice thinking like that. See what happens. And that will help you. 
you know, like when you go to university, aside from the really, really smart students, which students do the best? It's usually the Chinese and Indian or the, can be the ones from the Middle East. It's usually, you know, often, I mean, percentage-wise, not that they're like the best students in the school, but percentage-wise, usually, usually the foreign students do better and they party less and they're less frivolous. Why? Because their parents spend all this money and it's expensive for them to live in America and they pay more as foreign students. And so they know they are there to do well in school. You know, the, the local Americans are like, well, if I do well, that's, you know, I should. But they're also, it's not like they don't think it's the end of the world if they don't do well. They, they do okay, it's okay. And definitely we're there to party as well. But the foreign students tend not to party and tend to be serious students because they're, they were sent there by their parents to do well, not to party. As far as I can understand, that's maybe it's a broader generalization, but as far as I've seen, that's more or less how it is. So if you think that way about your Krishna consciousness, it's like, I am here. On, why are you here on this planet? To be Krishna conscious. Well, what about the parties? And what about the new movies? And what about... No, no, that's not why I'm here. I'm here to be Krishna conscious. So if you have that attitude, you'll be just fine, Stephanie. Nothing can stop you. Uh, yeah. So, so Nadia has a but question. But if this process of Krishna consciousness is meant to awake our awaken our love for Krishna that already exists in my heart, in our heart, or in your heart. I'm editing her. Right. All right, I'll stop editing. Then why, the more I practice, the more I hate Krishna? Where's this love that already exists? Because the dirt's coming out. The boulders, you know, you got to like, the boulders have, like they don't smell good when you move them. I didn't hate God before I joined KC Movement. I was just neutral, maybe a bit afraid. But now, instead of developing love for Krishna, I just end up hating him. It's probably more you hate yourself than him. Because, because, no, it's, it's, um, well, there's two things. One is you're going to be purified, so you're, you don't like it. No, no, I think, well, I'm going to answer Nadia's question in particular for her, which may not apply to everyone. I think it's about expectation. Like, you're God, so you should do A, B, and C for me. And, um, because you're not doing A, B, and C for me, then I don't like you anymore. So I will love you as long as I get my lollipop. If I don't get my lollipop, then I hate you. So I think that's kind of where you're at right now. It's all in the world of expectation. And I just sent you that verse from Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam 3, 1637. And it it talks about how Sometimes a devotee is put in a situation and um, it doesn't look like Krishna loves him. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. But Prabhupada's saying a devotee doesn't think that way. I just spoke to a devotee last night, Nadia. He's going to write a book. He was put in jail for six months. He said it was like total hell. It was. He owned a medical practice and there was some illegal, I guess, charging insurance companies or something that he wasn't aware of because he didn't do that. And no, you know, he had no, I don't know, some of the doctors that were working for him were doing something illegal. So, so it was his business. So he had to go to prison and he said it was complete hell. And he wants to write a book about it and explain all the realizations and amazing things that happened while he was there. So Prabhupada always taught us that what is ever, ever happening, we should think that Krishna is doing this not because he doesn't like us, but because we need it 
and there's a rainbow at the end of the tunnel. We have to have that faith. So if you lack the faith and you see it materially, then you'll resent Krishna for doing it. Krishna, I serve you, and the result of serving you is you put me in prison. I'm like, that's not right. But a devotee doesn't think that way. He thinks, okay, there's some reason, some purification. And Nadia, what, what I think you're going to see when you're older and you look back at your life is how much what you're going through now molded you into the person you've become, become meaning like 20 years from now. You will look back and say, you know, that was one of the pivotal moments of my life, going through what I was going through, dealing with it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That um, it's hard. Of course, it's, it's much harder when you're going through it, right? Because it's painful. But I like to think in retrospect about the future, about the present. Which, how do you think in retrospect about the present? You imagine how you might look at it ten years from now, or, or any time in the future. You ma imagine how you might look at it and how you might realize that th those that was building my strength. Those difficulties were giving me realization. And so I think, I think part of what you're saying in your question is it's a faith issue also, that what Krishna's doing for you is actually good for you. Because according to your perception, it's not. But it's also how you're processing it. And if you, like Nadia, you could do this exercise. What if Krishna came to you you're like you're like praying to Krishna. Why are you putting me through this situation? So he comes and says, "Well, I'll explain it." And let's say he explained it to you in such a way that you would clearly understand that you needed to be in that situation for your purification. Then you wouldn't hate him, and you wouldn't have this difficulty. And you'd probably say, "Yeah, that's true." If I if I knew what was going on, why? So maybe you could answer that question. If I ask Krishna, why are you putting me in this situation? If you love me, how is it love? Maybe you could answer that question and see why these things are happening and what the benefit is so you don't uh, resent him for doing that. Now, that's one part of the equation. There's another part of the equation which is important because when we're in a situation, we're saying, I'm a devotee and Krishna's putting me in this situation. And it doesn't seem fair. If he loves me, he wouldn't put me in this situation. Okay. Let's go with that idea. Did you have anything to do with the situation? Well, you can't say, no, I had nothing to do with it. No, but I had to come back here. I had to be here. Okay. But ultimately, that was a choice you made to go back and be there. But, 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 I am, okay, I know you have responsibilities. But ultimately, that was a choice. And if you had the chance to leave that situation, you would, if you could. And then you say, but I don't have a chance now. Okay. So, does that have anything to do at all with anything you've done in the past, past karma? Well, we don't know exactly, but we do know philosophically that the answer is yes. So, that being said, when you say, you know, Krishna, why are you putting me in this situation? I don't deserve it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's putting all the blame on him and not accepting any responsibility ourselves. That we have done many sinful things in the past. And, um, and aside from that, just personal karma, Having a material body, being in the material world, it's just difficult, right? So, you know, Krishna, why are you putting me in this situation? And Krishna says, why did you take birth? Why did you want to take another body? Why are you blaming me? You're the one who wanted it. You know, and you're going, yeah, but, 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 but. And, and Krishna's saying, but this is the nature of this world. What You thought that like, there was going to be no problems here? You know, it, it's funny because we all complain about problems, isn't it? You know, the weather's too hot, there's the government's too this, the inflation this, COVID that, you know, it's like, hey, hello, everybody. Did you do like a calculation on your compass, like where you are 
you know, you're like right in the midst of Kali Yuga, and and uh, hello, that's what happens. So it's kind of like walking into the hospital and go, God, there's so many sick people. What's going on here? You know, everyone's looking at you like, what's wrong with you? You know, what planet are you from? So it's a bit like that. Like, oh, the world's so bad. Yeah, like, well, what did you think? Like, it is the material world, right? Hmm, oh yeah, you're right. I was joking with uh, this devotee. We did the we did this little talk on astrology on um, Bodhika Arise, the men's podcast. You should see it. It's really good if you're interested in just understanding astrology better. So I was talking to him last night, and I said, you know, if I was an astrologer and I was dealing with a devotee, and I wanted to joke with him, I said, Prabhu, says right here you're going to die. And he's like freaking out. You didn't say when. And then you say something else so he knows you're joking. And I can see from your chart right here, you're going to get old. And it also says in your chart, you'll get diseased. So, you know, now you know. You know he's joking with you, right? So, yeah. Well, that's not fair. How could you say that? Yeah. You can't say that. You're in the material world. You can't say that. But my astrologer said I'm going to get old. That's not fair. You know, Krishna doesn't love me. You know, I'm getting old. He doesn't love me. I, I'm not a hot supermodel. That means Krishna doesn't love me. I'm not Bill. I'm not as rich as Bill Gates. That means Krishna doesn't love me. Um, everything's not perfect. That means Krishna doesn't love me. What is Krishna trying to teach us? He's trying to teach us. It's not perfect. The only thing that can be perfect is your consciousness if you learn how to deal with it. But if you're blaming Krishna for everything, then you're going to be one miserable person for sure. Because, like, it's Krishna's fault we took birth in the material world? I don't think so. We had a choice. So, Nadia, I have a suggestion for you. This word, but, just remove that from your vocabulary. So anytime you write something or say something, you can't use the word but. And that will help you a lot in formulating your understanding. Right, okay. So if, Krishna, uh, if Krishna loves me, but you had, but if this process of Krishna, no, take out the but. This process of Krishna consciousness is meant to awaken our love of Krishna. Yeah. That already exists. Yeah. Um, why the more I practice, the more I um, hate Krishna? That's the question you have to answer. Um, I would question, are you actually practicing it properly? Because the result of practicing it properly is the love of Krishna. So I think, you know, you may have to like, <clears throat> the perception, <clears throat> it's a little right or left, it's, the perception's off. Perceiving Krishna's mercy as Krishna's punishment, then, yeah. So, that's the problem. Yeah, that was a long answer. Yeah, you could, we could say more about it. Everything you do, how important is this for my Krishna consciousness? I'm alive to die in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, that's why you're alive. Ain't no other reason, Nadia. It's the only reason. P says, why are there so few people in the world? Or Pi, I'm not sure. Why are there so few people in this world who want to live or even hear about Krishna consciousness? And how do we reach them? Well, the reason there are so few is because that's why they came here. Why are there, you could say, why are there so few people in jail that like the government? <laughs> it's a bit like that, you know. Because they all got arrested. That's why they don't like the government. You know? This is the place for people who are not really that interested in God. They're more interested in themselves. They're, that's, they all come here. That's why. And how do we reach them? The best way to reach them, I think, the best way to reach them is to be ecstatic in Krishna consciousness. Because when you see someone who's ecstatic, 
who doesn't take drugs, you have to like deal with that. It's like, do you see that guy? He's ecstatic. He's just chanting and he's ecstatic and he's not on drugs. And I'm, you know, on drugs and I'm not as happy as him. That speaks volumes. So uh, we we share our realizations with others. We share our um, compassion to them. We share our happiness. That's the best way. Of course, we bring them prasadam, books, the holy name, invite them to associate uh, if someone associates with devotees, they become devotees. So we want to bring people into the Sangha. We want to show them the Sangha is blissful. That's the best way. Nadia says, we are devotees. We don't do what we like or what we don't like. We do what is best for our bhakti. Oh, I said that. Yeah. Maybe these situations are the building blocks for our Krishna consciousness. Yes. Wasn't my choice was because of COVID that I was forced to come back here. I was planning to go to another place. Yeah, so take it. Um, well, long, long ago, before you were born in your last life, you must have really liked Siberians because you took birth in Siberia. So you must have been thinking about Siberia, so it's your fault. Don't try to get out of it. Okay, so idea. If we accept that whatever difficulty we're going through is due to our own actions and choices, can we also remain hopeful the situation may improve by changing our actions? As I realize I am responsible. Yeah, it's this. If, if I always say, if doing the wrong thing works, like you get the wrong result, then how about doing the right thing? If thinking in the wrong way produces the wrong result, then wouldn't thinking in the right way produce the right result? You have experience of how it works on the negative side, so just have faith it works on the positive side. Um, I'm speeding up because I have to leave. Krishna always does favor, favors us. Sometimes we don't understand his plan. Sometimes short-term pain leads to a better deal. I guarantee Nadia, when she is older, she's going to look back at the COVID days and go, you know, that was a milestone in forming my strength in Krishna consciousness because, Nadia, if you get through this and actually can learn to appreciate um what Krishna is trying to do to you and teach you, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you'll realize that I needed this. If you if you don't have that realization, it's going to be hard for you. Well, then, if he's if if the if the truth of Krishna consciousness can't solve the problem, then what can? Because only you can solve it by taking it. That's the only way it can be solved. Because it's like, like, what answer do you want? You want us to make up some shlokas like that don't exist? You know, we can't do that. Um, we have to understand the philosophy and then apply it in our life and adopt it as a state of consciousness. And then we're fine. Um, what else can we do? I mean, the it, I wouldn't say it's insensitive. I would say it's actually what better bomb and solution is there than Krishna's words, right? I mean, okay, we know we know you're suffering, you're unhappy, but tomorrow you'll be happy. You'll say, oh, I'm I'm happy now. We had an ecstatic class. So how are we to understand what's going on? When you're in Krishna consciousness, you're happy. When you're not in Krishna consciousness, you're not happy. So, like, who's responsible for that? Krishna's giving you everything you need to be happy in spite of all the difficulty. And so when you apply it, you're happy. And um, you're not the only one in the universe undergoing difficulty. And devotees, by Prabhupada's mercy, are learning how to deal with those difficulties in a Krishna conscious way. That's the only way, because we, you know, you're in a situation you can't change. So, and, you know, it's just, it, it is what it is. And um, we can't um, eliminate the responsibility that we have for creating the situation. Any Anytime something bad happens to me, I always think it has to be 
some state of consciousness I'm in or something I've done that's creating this. I, I never think that Krishna doesn't like me, that's why he's creating it. I never think that way. I always think it has to be connected with what's going on in my head or something I've done, and there's a lesson here and I need to learn. So I always think, okay, what's the lesson here? Suffering is disease. Disease is dis-ease. If something's not working right, it means it's something I've done wrong, which has created it. So what have I done that I can stop doing? Or, or how does Krishna want me to see this? Because maybe I'm just seeing it wrong. Maybe there is nothing wrong, and I just need to see it differently. So these are Krishna's given us like all the lessons so we can see things from from a spiritual perspective because the external situation is going to be however it is you may be in a better situation but that may not also work out for you you get out of siberia then okay everything's good but then there may be some other problem and then you could think oh there's no, now there's another problem that means christian doesn't love me no there's always going to be some problem somewhere that's for sure you know this world is not problem free but krishna is giving us the ways to see those problems so we can deal with them in a Krishna conscious way. That's the idea. Okay, so it's time for Japa. Actually, it's past time, and I am on my way, and we'll see some of you there soon. Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhupada. Goranga Nitananda.